And welcome back to coverage here of the Players Tour Finals. Marshall Sutcliffe with Paul Chion, and we are heading into the last round of the day. That's right, we've got seven rounds that we've brought you today. This is going to be the seventh, and then tomorrow we'll be back for the other seven rounds before we cut to a top eight, which will be played next weekend. Down in the feature, though, we do have two players sitting at five and one coming into the round. We've got Christopher Larson versus Akira Asahara. The matchup, Paul, is teamer reclamation in the hands of Asahara impressed a lot of people with his play earlier today with the deck and then Jun sacrifice for Christopher Larson. As we head down to the match, can you break down the uh, the matchup for us? Yeah, I think uh, kind of coming into this, uh, traditionally speaking, I think Team of Reclamation is the deck that has the edge here. The Jun sacrifice deck is really good at grinding people out. So if the games do go long, it'll definitely bury people under the power of cards like Corvold and Trail of Crumbs. However, it doesn't have so much in the way of being able to just interact with the combination of Wilderness Reclamation plus Expansion Explosion. So, um, you know, what Chris is going to be looking for here is trying to get that quick start. But the Jun sacrifice deck just isn't that fast. OK, so we'll have to keep an eye on how things develop on Christopher Larson's side. We are kind of riding along with Chris uh, here. As you can see, he's on the, the bottom part of our screen. Therefore, now we kind of sit in his seat, as it were. It looks like we're playing on Arena. Now we do get, of course, Akira Asahara's hand as well. And it looks like Akira is on a mulligan to six here with an opener with one of the two Spectral Sailors, or is, does he only run one? I forget. And then uh, Mystical Dispute, an Uro, and three lands. Uh, versus whatever Chris is working with here. Yeah, it looks like, yeah, he's playing two copies of Special Sailor. So this is kind of the uh, the slot where a lot of different players for the, have chosen to play different cards for specifically the Team of Reclamation Mirror. Other people we've seen play cards like Nightpack Ambusher, for example. But Akira deciding to take it to the next level and go with Spectral Sailor here instead and trying to lean on the card advantage provided by the card instead of something like a Nightpack Ambusher, which is a little bit more expensive and also gets hit by a lot of the main deck Ether Gust that people are playing right now. Well, you see Uro on the battlefield here for Asahara, at least temporarily. Looking to ramp things out. Priest of the Forgotten Gods, a scary card, no doubt about it, to, to face down, um, especially if you are trying to get a creature to stay on the battlefield, though it doesn't look like that's Asahara's planet just, the, just yet. Yeah. And Asahara doesn't have a whole lot right now. And Chris Larson does have the Priest, which actually does a, a decent job of preventing the Spectral Sailor from drawing too many cards. But Asahara really needs to dig. I mean, again, not a ton of pressure here from Chris Larson, right? We, we see the Woe Strider, we see the Priest of Forgotten Gods, but um, I mean, that's just four damage. I mean, there's the Trail of Crumbs, but he's going to need to find something else here to keep applying pressure, or Asahara is going to have a few extra turns here to dig. So far on the battlefield, Christopher Larson's just been able to get Woe Strider and a Goat, as well as the Priest, but with nothing on the other side, not a whole lot to do there. As you can see here, Chris Larson not attacking with the Priest, keeping up the Sacrifice effect here potentially, while also uh, playing around a potential Shark Typhoon here for three. But with the draw that Chris has, Trail I mean, you can crumbs. see why this deck is especially good at, yeah, especially going into the late game, right? I mean, you have so many ways to scry and maybe sacrifice effects to gain gain card advantage. Trail of Crumbs, Chris Forgotten Gods, both cards that kind of let you cycle through your deck and find what you need. And it looks like Asahara is going to be going for the Spectral Sailor here to maybe just draw a card. 
curious to see if Chris Larson would be interested in sacrificing the Strider plus token here. And uh, yeah, it looks like he ran out the Spectral Sailor and uh, that's a Shark Typhoon. And one really interesting thing about Shark Typhoon in this matchup, uh, when you play against any of the Sacrifice decks, how big do you choose to make your Shark Typhoon? Because Claim the Firstborn is a real card that, that it's played in both the Jund and Rakdos Sacrifice variants. And as a result, sometimes you don't necessarily want to make it too big or your opponent might just steal it and kill you. But this was a huge, huge draw here from Chris Larson. Mayhem Devil off the top means that he does have basically enough pressure here to be able to close the door pretty soon. Curious to see if uh, uh, if uh, Akira chooses to go for the um, the Mystical Dispute here. Chris Larson would actually be able to pay for the Mystical Dispute, but in order to do so, he would have to sacrifice the Ghost Rider and the token to generate two mana, which isn't the worst because he does get Akira to sacrifice the Spectral Sailor here as well. All right, so... Let's see how this uh, this sequence ends up playing out. The Spectral Sailor on the battlefield, perhaps temporarily for Asahara. Getting anything with the Priest of Forgotten Gods feels pretty good when you're sitting in Christopher Larson's seat, especially if you can take advantage of the mana. Yeah, especially because there's not a ton of targets to steal from the um, Team of Reclamation deck. You have occasional Shark Typhoon tokens, and then if you get to the really late game, also escape Uros. So as the Reclamation player, you do need to be pretty careful when you choose to when you choose to escape the Uro. Uh, oftentimes you want to make sure you have a Negate or an Aethergust backup to be able to protect it from a Claim the Firstborn. Right, we've seen that uh, really be the downfall of some of these Team of Reclamation players where they finally get Uro on the battlefield. And remember, that can be quite a bit of work. Like a lot of times they're getting just to the number of cards in Graveyard needed to pay for the escape cost. And then just to have it stolen, hit them, life gain, draw a card, sacrifice it. It's not like they can just recast the thing again from the Graveyard. It takes a while to build up those resources. You know, that this isn't, you know, a, an older format with a bunch of fetch lands hitting the battlefield or hitting the Graveyard where all of a sudden you can get cards uh, like that back every turn or whatever, this actually takes a little bit of work to do it. So any time they go away, it's one of those things where, you know, it really does set them back a, a significant amount. And I'm curious to see now, we we see the uh, Priest of the Forgotten Gods take care of the uh, Spectral Sailor. So that, that little card draw engine is going to be done. And in the meantime, a really important card on the battlefield now with the Mayhem Devil, Christopher Larson starting to take steps in the right direction. Now, you see a few other cards in hand for Christopher that could have a very meaningful effect on this game as well. Bolas's Citadel stands out as an almost resolve it and win the game. Um, you know, we've seen players who looked behind at least as far as cards in hand or board situation went uh, steal games with that out of absolutely nowhere. It can do so many ridiculous things and the deck's actually quite good at manipulating the top of the library to make sure that it keeps getting multiple looks at free spells off of the Bolas' Citadel, even cards like Trail of Crumbs and uh, you see the Fabled Passage and that type of thing do that. Calder Familiar though, for Christopher Larson, you know, the one ingredient he doesn't have for kind of the full combo here is Witch's Oven. We do see the Trail of Crumbs. We do now see at least an attempted Cauldron Familiar plus the Mayhem Devil. Uh, everything's there. If the if a oven were to show up, it would be ridiculous. As it stands, still pretty darn good. Yeah, but the, the important thing here, though, for Akira is he does need to try his best to assemble pieces of the combo here because Chris's deck is just extremely good at drawing cards. Uh, this bla uh, this Blast Zone for two, though, will be quite strong. It'll get the Trail of Crumbs plus the Priest off the battlefield. Chris does have the Backup Priest. However, I mean, look at his hand. He's got that Bolas of Citadel, and he's very, very close to casting it. Right. Asahara has to walk this fine line where he's doing meaningful things that affect the board without the help of Teamer Reclamation itself. 
but also really wants to protect from the oops, I win from Christopher Larson if that Bolas' Citadel were to hit the battlefield. Now, Asahara has the answer with negate in hand, but needs enough mana and, and stuff to be able to maneuver while not losing to the board. I mean, that Mayhem Devil, yeah, it doesn't look amazing here because there's no repeat sack outlet at the moment, but it doesn't take much to turbocharge that thing. And Asahara is already down to 12. Yeah. Sahara has the option here of just digging here, making a 1-1, might want to just make the most use out of his mana, also continue filling up his graveyard, so he's got the opportunity to get that Uro into play. Really good draw here, Wilderness Reclamation off the top, and now Akira can choose to play Reclamation, make a decent-sized Shark Typhoon, keep up the Negate backup, but of course there is that uh, Priest of Forgotten Gods in play along with the claim the first board in hand and the Rakdos. Yeah, I know I know everybody was uh, really impressed watching Akira Asahara pilot this team or reclamation deck earlier uh, when he was in the feature match. And, um, you know, as an old school veteran, Asahara really does know how to play this game. Uh, I'm, I'm not super shocked to see this happening, but uh, it is nice to see, I will say. Yeah, he's been playing the game forever. And uh, yeah, he played extremely well in his earlier feature match against Ali Warfield. And uh, not surprised he has continued that, that success uh, late, in, late into day one. So Chris could be mindful of something like a negate here. The one nice thing though is if he does choose to go for claim the firstborn here and Akira chooses to go for the negate, which there's a good shot that he does, then he can just slam that bolus to Citadel. And then we get to have some fun. Citadel on the battlefield now for Christopher Larson, and this is where things get turbocharged. Take a look at this. There's already two spells. Here comes Solemn Simulacrum, and look at that. It's even going to shuffle away a land off the top of the library, just like he planned it. And there's another one. That's the fourth spell. There's the Witch's Oven for spell number five. Wow, a Trail of Crumbs, too. This is beautiful oh, stuff. Man. A second copy of Trail, and Christopher Larson is going off, and that is, in fact, going to be the game we talked about it as a potential oops i win well that's exactly what happened here for christopher larson that was insane yeah well i mean that's a power bolus of citadel right i mean you can just kind of completely go nuts he even had the option of kind of uh, looking a little bit deeper because he had access to the priest of forgotten gods but yeah that's the power of uh of bolus of citadel and also just you saw how how important having claim to firstborn is because he absolutely had to counter that that claimed the firstborn because you, you cannot let your opponent steal your Uro. But that was a cheap, cheap card that let that opened the door for Chris Larson to be able to play that Bolus of Citadel. That's right. Larson just overloaded Akira Asahara's resources there, where it was like, okay, I'm going to throw two things at you in one turn, and you kind of have to counter both. And if you can't, I'm going to win this game. And that's exactly what happened. That was incredible stuff from Christopher Larson looking to improve to six and one, but still needs to pick up another game off of Akira Asahara if he's going to do that. I will note, by the way, there are two players that are still undefeated out in the field, but uh, their internet quite wasn't quite up to snuff for us to be able to broadcast their match. So we do apologize for that. But we'll make sure to get an update for you uh, once we know the outcome of that. And it was Christoph Prince 
uh, from Germany playing against Alan Wu from the United States. And we actually already have a result from that. It is Christoph Prince. And Christoph is now undefeated here with four color reclamation coming into day number two. Congratulations to Christoph. And also, of course, a, a fantastic day one there for Alan Wu. But there is only one undefeated player in the field, and, and it's Christoph Prince. So great job. And it is four, t four color teamer rec trudging onward into uh, into day two here as the lone undefeated player. Game number two just so coming really along here. Really interesting sideboard decision here from from Chris Larson actually choosing to board out all of the claim the first boards after sideboarding. Whoa. Hmm. What do you, you know, make of that? You know what I think could be the reasoning? So I think the reasoning behind that is, the thing is, Akira is a heads-up player. He's very, he's very aware of the fact that Claim the Firstborn is a card that Chris could have, right? And as a result, he's going to play around it as much as he can. So Chris doesn't even need to have it in his deck to threaten that that card would exist. And Akira will do everything in his power to make sure when he puts that Uro into the battlefield, he has that counterspell back up anyways. So in or instead of just having a card that rots away in his hand and hoping that an Uro comes into play, he can just play more impactful cards instead. Yeah, I love that kind of gamesmanship that you see at the highest levels here. And we see a, a follow-up play. Christopher Larson actually had uh, a Gilded Goose there, but it did get stomped. But it's Trail of Crumbs to follow up with two food tokens on the battlefield as well. And it looks like Asahara is just going to take a little bit more of an aggressive stance here, run the stomp right into the uh, into the Bone Crusher Giant. We see Agonizing Remorse, but that's another life being lost here. And nothing really moving forward just yet for Christopher Larson, who stares down at his hand of three lands. He's really going to have to lean on this Trail of Crumbs to get him out of this. Yeah, I mean, the Gilded Goose also is nice as the, an additional way to be able to sack, cycle through those food tokens and and dig. But, I mean, Akira kind of now on the uh, the teamer tempo beatdown strategy here. We got the Bone Crusher Giant. We're going to see a, a cycle Shark Typhoon for two here. He can use some spot removal to get that Gilded Goose off the battlefield too. We see six power on the battlefield now for Akira Asahara, looking to try to even things up here against Christopher Larson. And he's slamming. I mean, these are big attacks here. You see that uh, there's Scorching Dragon Fire there as well that could be fired off. And critically, there's a Brazen Borrower in hand as well for Asahara, which could act as the, uh, the final points of damage, depending on how things pan out over the course of this next turn. Now, the food tokens, of course, are going to give Christopher Larson a buffer, but, uh, you know, he can only do that for so long, uh, having to spend all the mana for, for the trail and the food. This is interesting. He's going for a flame sweep here. It will not kill a shark token as it does not deal damage to your own flyers. A trail of crumbs is going to find Chris a does have goose some life of to work sack with. of the food. Mm -hmm. He's up to 10 life now, and that means that, uh, you know, it's going to be harder for Asahara to actually finish off this game in the next turn or two. Here comes Gilded Goose, which is yet another source of food. And of course, Larson hasn't missed a land drop here, having well, uh, flooding maybe is a little strong, but having drawn quite a few lands in the early stages. Woe Strider goes on the stack now as well. And uh, Asahara is taking a look at the Ether Gust or the Brazen Borrower, or even potentially, is there a red mana? Yes, the Scorching Dragonfire, and just trying to decide which one of these options would I like to use uh, at this juncture. Yeah, that's that's interesting, because you can use the Scorching Dragonfire 
as a clean way to get the Wo Wo Strider off the battlefield, but you can also use the Brazen Borrower, and then on the following turn when you untap, then you can use the Scorching Dragonfire to get that Wo Strider out of play. Yeah, make sure that although it's I guess that only delayed out, Larson the Gilded Goose as. Yeah, it came right back. So Gilded yeah, Goose looks goes like back he had on the, the battlefield. There, but now Christopher Larson's going to pass the turn back, and uh, Asahara is going to fire off the Scorching Dragon fire now to get rid of the Woe Strider. Larson says, "Sure, it's gone," because uh, that goat is not long for this world. It's going to jump in front of the uh, the Bone Crusher Giant. Only two damage getting in, but Larson is down to eight. But he's looking at the pantry here, and he's got four food tokens sitting there. So you got to figure that he can uh, stay alive for multiple turns, assuming that Asahara doesn't develop his board out in a meaningful way. Right, and not the ideal draw here, Cinder Vines, which is typically pretty good against Team of Reclamation. The deck plays a ton of spells, and of course it lets you deal with an onboard Reclamation. But right now, Chris just wants to find some creatures to put in front of that Bone Crusher Giant. There's a growth spiral off the top of the library for Asahara, who is looking to try to find some action here. We've had a fairly low to the ground draw here with, uh, you know, it looks like a fairly fair teamer deck uh, from this viewpoint. Nothing broken going on as he's sort of trimmed down some of those things. There is an Uro though into hand now, and that could be a big one. Yeah, Chris is down to four here. I mean, the uh, the the food tokens does still just buy him a decent amount some time. I mean, it, he still has a couple of turns available to him. But certainly needs to find something soon. I mean, I guess the Bone Crusher Giant just can't even get in anymore, right? So taking five a turn while still being able to gain three or six life and find relevant permanents to continue playing is not is not the worst. All right, well, Asah Asahara is now surveying the scene here and trying to figure out exactly how to uh, to proceed, but it's often good to kick things off with Uro Titan of Nature's Wrath. That's a good that's a good place to start most any turn. Either put it on the battlefield or maybe attack with it or get it back. In this case, it's just gonna come on temporarily and then go away. It is a pair of counters in hand now for Asahara, though. He doesn't actually have the mana to cast any of them, and I'm really curious Ooh. to see if Larson can come big, up with some way to help find. control this board. Oh, there's Mayhem Devil! Oh, and Koval. Yeah, that is huge. Now, I mean, now, yeah, that and the Corval. I think it's more important right now to probably get that Mayhem Devil on the battlefield, sacrifice some permanents, get that Brazen Borrower off the battlefield, get some of your life back. But those are two very, very big draws here for Chris Larson. Akira Asahara does have Ether Gust in hand, but right now he's only got that one man available. So Chris can try to do as much damage as he can with either the Devil or the Corval this turn. I like your line there, Paul. I mean, the Corval does get in the way of the flying creatures if it sticks around, but that's a risky proposition where the devil can come down and minimum kill the Brazen Borrower, and I'm assuming a pretty easily also take out the 2-2 uh, the Flying Shark. And if that's the case, then there's no more good attacks at all for Akira Asahara, and, uh, and Larson might be able to get a little bit of breath of air here. Of course, there are other things that could kill Larson, and I'm sure that he's going over the different ways uh, that that could play out. But for now, job number one is to get these flyers out of the air and make sure that Larson uh, has a better chance to survive for a few turns, because you can see it now. I mean, Larson has all the tools to completely dominate 
this game with Corvold and as well as some of these food tokens plus the uh, Trail of Crumbs plus the Mayhem Devil. You really don't need that much more to go right here to have uh, a win here. And that would be a match win for Christopher Larson, picking up a win in round seven here to improve to 6-0. and oh. So we'll have to see how this plays out, but uh, these were two huge top decks for Larson, no doubt about it. Yeah, absolutely. Mayhem Devil being the, the, big, the biggest possible draw here. The, having access to that, just being able to clear the board. And this is also why Joint Sacrifice typically is so strong against other creature strategies, right? The existence of Mayhem Devil lets you come back, you can gain a bunch of life, you can grind through your deck. So if you're gonna fight this deck on that axis, it's really, really difficult for them to beat. And the way Akira's draws lined up, that's kind of just what was given to him. And, um, you know, he, he, he's gonna need to find a way to shut the door. Expansion Explosion was a decent draw. If you can find that Wilderness Reclamation off the top. All right, back over to uh, to Asahara, who has a lot of work to do. Down to seven life is Christopher Larson. Expansion explosion in hand for Asahara with an ether gust and a negate. You can certainly see the pieces of the puzzle coming together on Asahara's side as well. But things could get out of hand uh, with the Corvold next turn. And, uh, you know, we've seen it before. It might be a one turn window where uh, Asahara has to try to find a Wilderness Reclamation or something like stat, or this game could just be over. Yeah, fortunately, Asahara has the has the Ether Gust to delay that by one turn, but then he's going to need an answer on the following mm -hmm. turn for sure. Asahara considering offering One a trade Bone Crusher Giant that, uh, for the Woe Strider. Yeah, one thing to note is that remember, Chris Larson did board out the claim to Firstborns. So th there is no, there's not going to be any hope oh, yeah. of a claim off the top here from Chris. Ultimately, Akira Asahara Little does trader. decide oh. to offer the trade here. And look at this, the Mayhem Devil's gonna jump in front. That's very interesting. That's bizarre. Oh, what a draw off the top. Ooh, duress. but it was Duress off the top of the That's library the for Ether Christopher Gust Larson. Out of Asahara's hand. Finds Duress. Unbelievable, what a draw. And he could not wait Post to put is that Post clear now for stack. Corval Baker's King to resolve. <laughs> the question is, do he's you just go for expansion chat, explosion? Says, by the way, well, we're not allowed no, he's to going, get he's excited. Going for ether gust. Like, I'm not allowed to get excited. Oh, okay. Oh yeah. There's Corval. Oh, look at this. I mean, even Cauldron Familiar is gain one life, deal one damage, draw a card, put a counter on Corvold. Not bad. So what happens now? Well, it looks like Chris Lars. So, Asahara probably just needs to go for an attack here. And what's going to happen is Chris Lars is probably going to chump block with the familiar, sacrifice it, and um, put a counter on the Corvold. Uh, alternatively, he can choose to go for the riskier line of blocking with Corvold and sacking two permanents, but that leaves you vulnerable to cards like Bone Crusher Giant and Expansion Explosion. So, I think we're going to see a block here with the Cauldron Familiar and then a sacrifice from the Low Strider. Yeah, that's what we're going to see. So the uh, Calder Familiar is going to jump in front. And it feels like this is Larson's game to win at this point, but he does need to work his way through.
And we've had we have what an explosion here for four that's available. Guess he doesn't really need to fire it off just yet. Corbel doesn't have is not representing lethal right now. So this is on Chris. Oh, we're we're still looking. No, there, there's, there's the decide. card draw trigger here. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, we're just deciding on Asahara. <clears throat> yeah, looks like he's decided to go in the tank here. And he's going to go for the explosion here on the Woe Strider, just for two. Finds Shark Typhoon and a Ketria Triome. But Corvold is going to start doing Corvold things, and that is not good news for Akira Asahara. Well, another land off the top of the library, though, for Larson. After scrying one to the bottom. This Trail of Crumbs kind of has a lot riding on it. Yeah, so, I mean, Chris will be able to get a lot of value. He can play the Trail of Crumbs, attack with Corvold, sacrifice the Trail of Crumbs. You'll draw a card and get two triggers here off the Trail of Crumbs. Asahara might just choose to go for Negate here to prevent that. Yep. Chris has other ways to get the engine rolling here. He can activate, you know, he's gonna activate Gilded Goose. Get back Cauldron Familiar, sacrifice the food, trigger Corvold, trigger Trail of Crumbs. Not bad. And it looks like it's a pair oh, of a Cauldron lot of kitties Familiars now. now in hand for Christopher. Mm hmm. Well, we. Oh, and this I is mean, not good those news are just chump for blockers. Asahara. Corvold in the red zone. Yep, just throwing it in. Boom. And another chump blocker in the form of Cauldron Familiar as one. Larson passes the turn back over to Asahara Ooh. and says, I'm going to kill you next turn if you don't do anything and a land off the top is not good news for Asahara. Still, Shark Typhoon in hand. Yeah, he's going to be able to make a 7-7 seven, seven here, which is, of course, not even going to come close to be able to dealing with this Corvold, which, you know, I've tried to do Corvold math in the past. You know, we saw Pyotr Golgovsky win a uh, Mythic Championship <laughs> with Corvold, and uh, it, it's always way more than I think it's going to be. <laughs> so, so I just assume it's going to be like a 12 I feel the exact same year. way. So it looks like Uro's going to get in. That does make it 11, but still, that's not going to help. This card has to be good. It's a Ketria Triome. Hmm. So three lands in hand, I suppose you can put one of them on the battlefield. But uh, yeah, Christopher Larson with Jund. A close call here, but looks very ready to turn the corner and win this game in a turn or two, assuming that a miracle doesn't happen for Asahara. Yeah, the card Asahara really needs to find here is Ether Gust. So, you know, he's probably going to be cycling Shark Typhoon here to, to find some cards. Uh, you might also see the Triome here first in case he draws a Wilderness Reclamation. But he really, really does need to find Ether Gust to delay this Corvold from going wild, which it already has, to be fair. Yeah, and I mean, that's really just to keep Asahara from dying for that turn, right? Uh, Ethergust is not a permanent solution to Corvold, and yeah, I could I could see uh, Corvold winning that game even if a gust is found. So this is really a dire situation here for Asahara. Let's 
this another cycle? Looks like another cycle. Yeah, this is another Triumph Ooh. cycle. It's another yeah, Shark that's... Typhoon. I don't think that's going to do it. You can Shark Typhoon for two, but Chris Larson can play Mayhem Devil? Make a food with the Gilded Goose, sacrifice it, and then the sacrifice trigger off the Corvold should kill a 2-2 Shark Typhoon. That should be a lethal attack. Yeah, I guess that Asahara would just have to wait until the Corval trigger resolve there. Is there any other thing to right, sacrifice? Right, right, of course. Well, he could also play Cinder Vines At any rate, we, we are digging trailer deep. Crumbs, right? That is also an option. Yes. He can he can play Cinder Vines even. Yeah, th this is this is not going to go well. Mhm. Mm There it is. Mayhem no, and now he cycled for zero, now. so that's it. Yeah. And that's a good game from Akira Asahara. Jeez. And Christopher Larson picks up the win two games to zero with, at least in some ways, a forgotten deck, right? I mean, this is, you know, Jun Sacrifice has had its place at the top of standard for a stretch, but it's been a while since, since Jun Sacrifice has really been kind of the deck that you turn to. But boy, whenever it does its thing, it's so impressive. It's really, really powerful deck. Yeah, definitely. Just that engine, right? The engine of Trail of Crumbs with Corvold, whenever you kind of see that going, it just draws you so many cards and you're just able to just completely bury your opponents in card advantage. And that's basically what we saw. Uh, Asahar didn't really get those explosive starts and you just saw Larson slowly churn through his deck. And once he found the pieces that he needed, I mean, he was just up way too many cards. Way too many cards, way too much damage, way too much value flowing for Christopher Larson. Great job to him. That's gonna do it for our rounds here. We've got updates and more to bring you, but first, these messages. This dragon fire off the top is gonna allow Ray to be able to two for one himself again to get rid of the second Regisaur, but now this, uh, you know, this Strider is uh, still a big threat here. Having a great card in hand, we see a scry into another Woe Strider. There's a Cinder Vines down, able to take out a Reclamation. Ping yeah, was, for all the non-creature spells that get cast. Yeah, that was a perfect draw for William there. Give, gives him a, a great turn here with the double spell. Two very powerful ones at that. Bottom, bottom. Definitely uh, not ideal for Ray there. A bottom <laughs> spiral and pull. And ooh. Mm, Nightshake Ambusher with only one, one green, green mana. Source. That's no. devastating. That's definitely a feels bad. Ray sitting here with the dog. That honestly, that play. that Nightpack Ambusher could have really brought Ray back into this game, but being stuck on single green is pretty brutal. Yeah, would have been able to block that first Woe Strider, generate a token. Yeah. Uh, block the second Woe Strider every single turn using the tokens being generated. Instead, we're seeing potentially just a game get ended here. A second Cinder Vines. Oh, no. Right, you are not in a good spot. Big time draw there. And yeah, I really, I don't see, there's no storm drafts in Ray's. Oh, looks like. Democratic just going threat after threat after threat. Here comes the Wilderness Reclamation, unable to even impact this game state. In fact, would end the game even sooner by giving a target for the Cinder Vines. Wow, and there and it is. That's game. William Craddock, our champion from Players Tour 3. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to coverage of the Players Tour Finals. I'm Maria Bertholdi. I've got Cedric Phillips and Riley Knight hanging out with me here at our virtual news desk. And that is a wrap for us here on day one of the tournament. Cedric, for you, what are some of your favorite moments or your takeaways from the tournament so far? I did it again, Maria. Maria, it's my first time doing this. <laughs> I was waiting I'm for you to figure it out. <laughs> uh, you just left me out there to die? Unbelievable. 
<laughs> Unbelievable. Um, my takeaway, I'll repeat myself very quickly. My takeaway was that um, we saw a little bit of everything and we saw a little bit of everything win. In a tournament that is over 50% Wilderness Reclamation decks, we saw this, what, this four color Super Friends deck win. We saw Mono White win. We saw Mono Green win. Uh, we saw a little bit of everything win where I was expecting, you know, those decks to get run over by Wilderness Reclamation and Expansion Explosion. That just wasn't the case. Uh, we, you know, uh, the field isn't the most diverse. We can look at that numbers wise, but we are seeing a diverse group of decks actually do some winning. Now, how does that translate into tomorrow? We'll have to see. But, you know, my takeaway from this was, yeah, maybe there is still some room for innovation. Maybe Ken Yukihiro can just do things and other people can do things and win. All right, well, let's take a look at our standings here before we get into day two tomorrow. Let's find out who is at the top of our leaderboard, and it is none other than Christoph Prince, our lone undefeated player at seven and oh. Riley, what stands out to you here? It's great to see a diversity of uh, of nationalities getting it done as well. We've got some Americans, we've got some a people from Asia, we've got some Europeans. It's great to see that people have turned up not from not not only with you know a, a couple of different decks from around the uh, around the standard format, but also from all the four corners of the globe. So it really is. It's been it's been a wonderful day. One I'm looking forward to day number two. Yes, absolutely. Here is a peek at nine through sixteenth place here in our tournament two. Cedric, thoughts here. Uh, you see one of the Gertsons doing well here, unfortunately for Simon, not having the best tournament. Dominic is doing fantastic. Akira Asahara, who is someone I'm a huge fan of, making day number two with Team of Reclamation. Uh, and someone who qualified for this tournament, not once, not twice, but three different ways in Abe Corrigan, a youngster, five and two in day number two of competition. I'm excited to see him play tomorrow if we have the opportunity to have him in a feature match. Yeah, so that's going to do it here for us on day number one. Thank you to everybody who tuned in and watched our tournament here from isolation going out around the world. Thank you, Cedric. Thank you, Riley, for being my desk mates all day. 9 a.m. Pacific is the time to be back here tomorrow to watch day two of the Players Tour Finals.